You're listening to the Mississippi Outdoors Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Wyatt. If you like things like turtles, salamanders, little ones, big ones, snakes, you're in luck. Our guest today is our state herpetologist here at MDWFP. She is Emily Field from the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. This episode of the Mississippi Outdoors Podcast is brought to you by the Foundation for Mississippi Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. You're listening to the Mississippi Outdoors Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Wyatt. And if you like things like reptiles and salamanders and alligators and snakes, you are in luck. We're talking today with Emily Field, our state herpetologist over at the Museum of Natural Science. Emily, welcome to the show. Thank you. Did I kind of get the ballpark there? You snakes? did, yes. Uh, yeah. Um, so I study reptiles and amphibians. So snakes, turtles, alligators, frogs, salamanders, um, basically all the creepy crawlies. Yeah. So, and you use the word study. Yes. Okay. So like you go to school, you learn how to do this, mm -hmm. but really the job is you continue to study these things. It's kind yeah. of a research deal. It's, isn't it? Yeah. We never stop learning. And research is mainly what I do. Um, I work with the threatened and endangered species we have in Mississippi mainly. Um, and I do research on their populations, the status of their populations, their distribution, and uh, what the potential threats to those populations might be. Okay. What's your background? How'd you get to this job? Yeah. Um, so I'm originally from Arkansas and I grew up kind of a feral little kid. I was always outside tromping around in the creek or the neighborhood pond or the woods. Um, and I just, I always had a love for the outdoors. I always had a love for the creatures out there. Um, I especially liked the reptiles because like turtles, they were easy to catch and then yeah. I could look at them. Um, but I always just loved being outside. And from a very young age, I knew I wanted to be a scientist. Uh, so I went to college as a biology major at the university of central Arkansas. Okay. Um, I got into collared lizard research there. Um, that was kind of my first step into wildlife research. And if you don't know, collared lizards are probably the coolest lizard, I would say maybe in the U S personally, I have a little bit of bias there. They're about, uh, the size of your hand. If you don't count the tail, okay. if you count the tail. They're about the size of the tip of your hand to your elbow. Okay. They have a really long tail because they run on their hind legs. Um, I did not know we had that. It's amazing. So we don't have them here in Mississippi. We okay. were in Missouri, but they're just this bright turquoise and yellow lizard. They're amazing. Um, and they stand up and run on their hind legs. They do. Yes. And we catch them by, we have extendable fishing poles and we have uh, lassos tied to the end of them, and you lasso the lizards by the head, and then you grab them. And it doesn't seem real, but it's very fun. Very fun. Um, so then I went on to get my master's at Arkansas State uh, studying snakes. Um, I was studying stress physiology, reproduction, and immunity in water snakes. Okay. And then where did the, how did the path lead to this job, state herpetologist here in Mississippi at the museum. Yeah, I actually got really lucky. I uh, got to curate the Arkansas State Herpetology Collection, the Natural History Collection at uh, during grad school. And that directly led into this job. I saw that the job opening was posted and they were specifically looking for someone with curatorial experience because we are based out of the Natural Science Museum. Um, so that's a big reason I ended up here and I'm really lucky because I love it. And, and one year, basically, about now into mm -hmm. the job here. Mm -hmm. How's it been so far? It's been amazing. Better than I could have expected. I have had so many experiences I never could have expected. And it's just been, it's been a dream. Okay. The snapping turtle. Yes. I, when I was doing a little research and kind of reading, and, and I sort of lit up because, you know, any of us who've walked along the edge of a pond, you know, fishing or walked through a swamp, mm -hmm. you know, going from one spot to another, we either have encountered snapping turtles or we wonder if we're going to encounter one. Yeah. They're kind of a big deal, aren't they? They are absolutely a big deal. And what's really interesting to me is here in Mississippi, you mostly encounter alligator snapping turtles. They're so common here and they're not as common elsewhere, but they are just everywhere here. And they're a very fun species. Um, they get a little bit of a bad reputation because, you know, they do look like giant dinosaurs and people think they'll bite your arm off, but they're actually pretty, as long as you leave them alone, they're pretty docile. Once, you know, we have them in our traps and we're putting them in the boat, then they're pretty angry. Okay. The reputation too, of having the ability to, you know, bite off a toe, bite yeah. off a finger, they really are that strong? Depends on the size of them. Some of the biggest ones, they might get a finger, but 
Not not for the most part. For the most part, I would think you'd maybe just break a finger. Yeah. It's not as bad as people expect. As expect. I wonder why, though, there are so many in Mississippi as compared to other places. Any theories? I genuinely don't know. I think we have, especially in the Delta, our biggest ones are in the Delta. And yeah. I like to say that they're corn fed out there. Um, <laughs> they, I mean, we're regularly getting 120 pounders, 130 pounders. I mean, they're turtles that weigh as much as me. They're, they're huge. Um, and so I think we just have a really good environment for them. There's lots of food. There's lots of space for them. I think they've just kind of settled into this environment and they've become the dominant species. How old can a snapping turtle be? I believe the oldest we've documented is about 70 to 80 years old. So there, there's some grandpas out there. How about that? That's really cool. I, I saw another one on the list, Alabama red-bellied. Yeah. So that's... A very special species to me. That's the one I'm actually doing research on right now. Okay. Um, I just finished up our surveys for the year and we'll continue with more populations next year. Um, the Alabama red belly turtle is really unique. It's our only endangered turtle uh, in Mississippi, if we don't count, of course, the sea turtles. Um, and it is only found in the coastal rivers of Mississippi and the Mobile Bay of Alabama. So it has a very limited range. Um, but we are doing status surveys on it right now. The last time we did a survey on them was in 2012. So it's been a little bit and we're just trying to update those, uh, populations, their distribution, see how they're doing. So in, in my very novice mind on turtles, you know, I can picture a big, huge snapping turtle. Yeah. Uh, I can picture a box turtle. So if that's, what's in my head, how, how give me kind of the image of a, Alabama red belly. Yeah. What do they look like? So they are a um, what we call an amided turtle. So they're kind of a a, a slider turtle. Okay. Um, if you think of a red-eared slider, you're close. Um, they're a type of river cooter. Their closest relative is the river cooter. Um, okay. They look almost identical. It is very hard to tell them apart. It's very um, specific things we're looking for. It's the shell shape. We're looking for a specific pattern on their head. We're looking for a pattern in their irises. We're looking for a uh, specific, we call it the maxillary cusp. It's a little notch in their mouth. It's very little things. So it's hard mm. to tell from a distance, but once, mm. you know, we catch them in our nets and we're looking at them in the boat, then we can tell them apart. So they're big. They're um, probably about a foot, foot and a half long. So it's bigger than a box turtle. Definitely bigger than a box turtle. Yes. Bigger <laughs> than a red-eared slider, but they look pretty similar. Okay. In general, why are turtles important to sort of our environment, our ecosystem? Yeah. So turtles are kind of a, they're, they're, they're similar to snakes in that they play kind of a middle of the food web role. Um, they're going to, it depends on the species, of course. Um, some are going to be herbivorous. Some are going to be omnivorous. Some are going to be more carnivorous. So our alligator snappers, they're going to be carnivores. They're going to eat fish. Um, actually, a little side note, alligator snappers have this really amazing feature. It's called a lure in their mouths and they use it, especially when they're younger. It's just this little pink dangly bit of tissue that they use and they wiggle around with their mouth open to entice fish to come in. They think it's a worm. The fish comes in and they wow. snap down and eat the fish. So they are like fishermen. Yeah. Born basically. Fishermen. Yes. <laughs> they're the fishermen of the turtle world. Wow. Um, so they're going to kind of play that role as carnivores in the food web. Um, and then we have our others that are going to be eating uh, some of our aquatic vegetation. So they play an important role in just keeping the ecosystem balanced. This one has come up before. It always does seem to come up. I saw gopher tortoises mm -hmm. uh, on a list of things I read. The difference between a tortoise and a turtle. Mm -hmm. how, so, how do we tell? Mainly what I tell people is you're not really going to find a tortoise in an aquatic environment. They're not going to be swimming around. They're not going to be living in the water. Yeah. They're mostly terrestrial. Their bodies are shaped very differently. So with turtles, you're going to see little webbed feet. With uh, tortoises, especially with the gopher tortoise, we like to say that they have uh, elephantine limbs. They oh. look kind of like an elephant's legs. Um, they're built to travel across land versus turtles that have the webbed feet, they're going to use those to swim around in the water. Okay. So, I mean, there's a million questions that come to mind. That's a lot about turtles. You mentioned snakes. Yes. You are an expert at identifying venomous snakes. Mm -hmm. I have that right? Yes. So 
Is that kind of the most common question you get, like at the museum and elsewhere? Like, how do I know? Absolutely. Good snake, bad snake. Absolutely. You know, quote unquote. Yes, quote unquote. Yeah. Um, in my opinion, they're all good snakes. Okay. But um, yeah, that is the most common question I get. And uh, we do have we have events where I give a talk on uh, the venomous species of Mississippi, and I always tell people that you know you hear things like oh venomous snakes have a diamond shaped head, or they have slit pupils, or they have like a really fat body, and I hate to say it, but none of those are accurate. <laughs> um, any non-venomous snake can flatten their head into a diamond shape, and they do that when they feel threatened. It's a form of mimicry. Mm -hmm. um, and it's true that our pit vipers have slit pupils like a cat's eyes, but their eyes work like ours. So if it's dark outside, those pupils dilate, and then they look round. And you don't want to grab a copperhead because you thought it had round eyes and it's just dark outside. See, and that explains why at times, I, like on social media, I'll mm -hmm. see a picture. Yeah. And, and an expert will identify it one way or the other. And by looking at the picture, I think, well, that kind of goes against what I've been told, the shape yeah. of the head, the eyes. So it's not always that simple. No, it's uh, oh, never that simple. And for, I wish it was. That'd be really great. But um, honestly, the only way to really identify venomous species is to just know your venomous species, which sounds like a lot. But we only have six species in Mississippi that are venomous. And they're all very different. It's hard. Like once you know what to look for, it's hard to mix them up. Um, so, for example, with copperheads, I tell people to look for the Hershey's Kisses pattern um, on the sides of the body. And yeah. if you look up a copperhead, you'll notice it immediately. Um, and then with the diamondback rattlesnake, I mean, there's just nothing else that looks like that with that diamond pattern. So once you know what characteristics to look for, it really is pretty easy to identify venomous species. You just have to know what you're looking for. At the museum and in what mm -hmm. you do, y'all have the ability for people to kind of see those species up close and personal as opposed to looking at a picture. Correct? Yeah, we do. I would think that's invaluable experience yeah. in learning how to identify them because pictures are one thing, but seeing it in person, absolutely, that's the difference maker. Yes. So we have many of those species live on uh, display in our exhibits area, but then what a lot of people don't know about the museum, they, they know about our exhibits, they know about our aquariums. What they don't often know is that we have collections behind the scenes. Um, we house natural history collections for mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, uh, fish, mussels, crayfish, you name it, we have it. Um, so another thing that's really helpful is, you know, like when I've taught herpetology classes, getting out those specimens, mm -hmm. those preserved animals for them to look at, because yes, you can look at a picture, but even if it's not alive, seeing that actual animal is extremely helpful in learning those identifications. Okay. Most common venomous snake in Mississippi of the six mm. kinds that are, and does it, it, does it change geographically depending on what's part of the state you're in? It probably changes somewhat, but I think it's pretty safe to say that cotton mouth is the most oh. common. Um, you can't really take a step in Mississippi without being around them. I mean, they're everywhere and they're very common. Um, now people hate cotton mouths. They <laughs> will tell you that they chase you. They'll tell you that they're aggressive and I know I'll get flack for this, but I'm telling you, they don't chase you. They're not aggressive. They're just very curious. Mm -hmm. Every other snake, every other venomous species wants nothing to do with you. Cottonmouths are not afraid of you. They right. are bold and they'll look at you and say, what are you going to do about it? They'll come and investigate. Absolutely. Yeah. So one of my favorite stories from grad school was I had caught a non-venomous water snake and I was sitting on a log taking a blood sample from it. And a cottonmouth just came out of nowhere and just slithered up and curled up about a foot away from me on the log. And I'm telling you, it was watching me. It was looking at what I was doing, just trying to figure out what I was doing. I'm like, okay, you just, if you stay there, we're good. But <laughs> just completely unafraid. You and two snakes on a log. Yes, correct. Okay, so when did you develop a non-fear of snakes? Or were you never afraid I of them? I don't think I was ever really afraid of them. I get this question a lot, and... I've thought about it a lot, especially since starting here, and I just don't think I ever really developed a fear of them. I actually have a very vivid memory of being a kid going on bike rides with my family, and my mom always made us stop at this one bridge crossing to look at the snakes basking in the creek. Yeah. And I don't know, I think I just kind of always had an appreciation for them, and I was never really... No, no one in my family was really afraid of them, so I don't think I ever really developed that fear. Um, but it wasn't until I started working with lizards that I developed a love for them. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> so the lizards were the game changer for you. Oh, absolutely. And and then now here you are. And and okay, so turtles, we talk a little bit about snakes mm-hmm. and then uh amphibians. Yeah. And when I saw the word hellbender, I thought, okay, I gotta know more about what this is. Yeah. What is a hellbender. What is that? It is one of the coolest species we have in Mississippi. It is a giant aquatic salamander. So with a lot of salamander species, they have an aquatic juvenile stage. They hatch from eggs. They uh, look like tadpoles almost as larvae. And then they metamorphose like a frog and become terrestrial. Um, these never met. They, they stay in the water their whole lives. Um, they'll go from a juvenile stage where they have external gills But eventually they will reabsorb those gills and they just breathe through their skin, which is very weird to think about. Um, One of the nicknames for them is lasagna lizard, Um, because if you look up a picture of them, their skin is folded in a way that it kind of looks like lasagna noodles. And it's so that they have more surface area for the water to pass over and they absorb the oxygen in the water through their skin as it passes over them. So... They can get to be about two feet in size. Wow. They they get huge. Yes. Um, they're not very common here, but they are one of our most amazing species. Where, like statewide, primarily no, certain areas? They're only found um, in the extreme northeast corner of the state around Tishomingo. And okay. until last year, they were only known from one stream in Mississippi. They had only ever been found in one stream. Um, so they're very, very limited range in Mississippi. Sure. Now you and I were talking earlier, is Mm -hmm. that the species of the babies that you discovered the, the, what do we call it? The larval stage. Yeah. So last year we discovered a larval hellbender, um, which was a first for the state. We've never documented, um, a larval hellbender before there. The last one documented in Mississippi was in 2015 out of the stream where we typically find them. It was an adult male. They named him Hector. Um, but none have been seen since then. And then our, uh, we have a fish biologist and a crayfish biologist. They do a lot of aquatics work, a lot of aquatic stream research at the museum. And they were out doing a survey in a stream in the area, not the stream where we catch them, different stream. And they saned up this larval salamander and they called me like, Hey, what is this? <laughs> and we're me and a couple other people at the museum are looking at pictures of this thing. And we're like, I, that's, that's a hellbender. I, I can't believe it, but that's a hellbender. So that was the first time we documented a juvenile. And it was the first time we documented any outside of the one stream where we've ever seen them. So it was really, really an exciting find. And that was also Northeast Mississippi. Yes. Though. Yes. And, and the first larval uh, hellbender salamander yes. in Mississippi that have been documented. We've only ever seen adults here. Wow. Yeah. So it means there's a mom and a dad out there somewhere and they are successfully reproducing. So it was very exciting. A few fist pumps in the round. Yes, like, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Okay. So um, what was the other tiger salamander? Yeah. So the difference between hellbender and tiger salamander, what is that? So they are different uh, genera. So when I said that the most, when you think of salamanders, you think of them having that aquatic juvenile stage and then becoming terrestrial. That's what the tiger salamanders do. They're closely related to um, spotted salamanders and marbled salamanders, which people might be a little more familiar with. Those are some of our more common ones. Um, But we thought they were extirpated from Mississippi. When I started in my position, we um, go through the state wildlife action plan and we had them listed as extirpated from the state, which means they don't, they don't exist here anymore. It's similar to being extinct, but it's extinct from our state, mm. basically. Um, and then actually it was on the Mississippi Naturalist's Facebook page. This woman posted a picture and uh, she has an organic farm up in around Holly Springs. And she posted this picture. She's like, this weird salamander rolled out of my tarp when I was uh, rolling it out to, to air it out for the season. And People were like, you need to report that to the museum. And she is fantastic. She is so passionate about these salamanders. She loves them. She lets us come up to her property and there is a whole population of them. She's found them just walking down the dirt road. Um, There was one in her carrot patch. One was just hanging out in her storage closet. And then last year she let us come up after the rain event where we figured they'd be breeding and we found egg masses, a ton of egg masses. So it's the only population we know of in the state. 
and that's the Holly Springs area, mm-hmm. so Northwest Mississippi. Yes. Mm-hmm. So we're kind of zeroing in on that North Mississippi corridor, I guess, you know, north of 82, yeah. up in that area. I wonder what it is. Is it just a climate? Or? I think it's just different. So Tishmingo is that Northeast corner is yeah. one of our biodiversity hotspots. Um, we have very different geology there. So we get very different species there. Um, you know, when you think of streams and rivers in Mississippi, mostly you think of brown water, you think of sand. Um, those are really the only spots in Mississippi where we find clear rocky bed streams, which that's what the hellbender needs. So that's why we only find them there. We also have these, you know, Mississippi's a little, uh, elevationally challenged, let's say, (laughs) except for that area. So where we have bluff and uh, cliff faces, we're going to find different salamander species that zero in on that habitat. So it's just very different geology, very different habitat in that area. Okay. So this part of the state. Yeah. Pearl, excuse me, Pearl River map turtles. Easy for me to say. Say that five times fast. Yeah, exactly. What are we talking about there? Map turtles, as in like a map that you would look at. uh, So they get that name. Um, that whole group of species, we have a bunch of map turtles in Mississippi. If you look at the pattern on their shell, it almost looks like a topographical map. Um, So that's where we kind of say their name map turtle came from. But we have a few species. Um, The Pearl River map turtle is actually uh, potentially going to go up as a threatened species under the Endangered Species Act. Um, That's still kind of in the process. Um, But that is one we find in this area. They are this big, maybe a foot, half a foot in, um, size. They're interesting because, uh, they have, uh, they're what we call sexually dimorphic, meaning that there are differences, um, morphologically between males and females. Females get way bigger than the males. Mm. I mean, if you get a big one, it's a female. They also have something called megacephaly, which means the females in particular, their heads get giant. I mean, huge, like compared to their shell, you're like, how are you holding that thing up? Yeah. <laughs> and it's because they're um, mollusk eaters. They'll eat snails. They'll eat mussels. So if you look at their mouth, they have this uh, flat palate that they use with those giant jaw muscles to just crush shells. Um, so they're a really important species to Mississippi. They're not super common. Um, they're not doing great. Their populations are not doing super well. Um we have them here in the Pearl River um, behind the museum, for example, and that's one of their worst populations, whereas historically it was okay. Hmm. Um, they co-occur with the ringed map turtle, which its name is pretty self-explanatory. They have these really quite pretty uh, orange rings on their shell. Um, the ringed map turtle, its best population is right behind the museum. We call it the Lakeland population. That one is listed under the Endangered Species Act as threatened, and that is its only stronghold, quite honestly. That population has skyrocketed. We have no idea why. Mm. It's the only stronghold for that species. Every other population throughout the state isn't doing great. So we got to hopefully try and protect that population. Um, But the Pearl River map trail is going to co-occur with that one throughout uh, where it's found. At the museum, Emily, in in your job and in your role, do you do presentations? You do tours? Are you involved in that kind of stuff there? I am. Yeah. So I do um, my venomous species talk quite often. I do it at the museum. I've also uh, gone and done it at a few conferences. I've done it at a few of the uh, Department of Transportation conferences. They come across a lot more snakes than you would think when they're mm-hmm. out doing field work. Yeah, I bet. Um, and then I do give tours, um, not as much as maybe our educational staff does, but I do give tours um, fairly often, especially when people come to tour the collections We don't get as many people coming back there to tour those, but anytime we do, we're very excited about it because we're very passionate about what we do and not a lot of people know what we're doing back there. They just know we're sequestered back there doing something. (laughs) When you're talking to a group, what's maybe the most common question that you get from someone or the most common type of question that you get? Well, if it's a little kid, they always ask me, is it dead? (laughs) Unfortunately, yes, it is. (laughs) Um, But... A lot of times we get the question of um, how many species do we have back there? Depends on the collection for the herpetology collection. We're closing in on about 20,000 specimens. I have to brag on our fish collection. It's mo- our, it's our most impressive. We've got over a million fish in that collection. Um, wow. We recently hit our 100,000th lot. So groups of fish get uh, 
accessioned together. Um, and our former director was the former ichthyologist. So we let him accession the, uh, hundred thousandth lot. Um, mm -hmm. so those are probably the most common questions. People are, are usually surprised at how big the collections are and they want to know just how big they are. Yeah. As the state herpetologist, mm -hmm. it's like a typical work day, typical work week. Cause I mean, field work, research, yeah. Tishomingo County, the Delta presentations in the museum. Is it a pretty irregular schedule? Every day is different. That's actually one of the things I love most about the job is okay. that I no week is the same. No day is the same. Um, there are days. So the past two months, most of my time has been down on the coast, um, driving around in my boat, setting uh, hoop nets to catch turtles, um, which I'm getting paid to boat around. It's pretty sweet <laughs> job. It's pretty great. Um, some days it's like that. Some days I'm, uh, in the office writing technical reports, entering data, analyzing data. And then some days I'm helping out around the museum. Sometimes it's with events. Sometimes it's with, um, exhibits. You know, we all kind of pitch in when we get new exhibits or when we have to take down. Um, it's just, it's something different every day, which is really fun. Yeah. yeah and I was looking at some of the experiences. So getting mud kicked in your face, uh, by a soft shell turtle. Yes. Was that, I guess, trying to get away maybe? Or? It was. It was in an agricultural ditch. Um, and I learned from uh, one of my grad school friends, they call that soil gumbo. I did not know this. <laughs> that stuff is thick and sticky and yeah. it's like quicksand. You just sink into it. Um, I was trying to catch the soft shell and it was huge. I mean, it had to be like two feet long. I was trying so hard to catch it. I was crawling in this ditch as fast as I could. And it's just, it's got those little webbed back feet and it's just kicking mud straight into my face. There was a farmer just standing there watching me, not saying a word, just watching me get embarrassed by this turtle. And finally I catch it. And he asked me if I was going to eat it. I was like, not quite, but I'm glad you got to witness this. <laughs> if only video existed, right? Exactly. Yes. <laughs> um, shaking a snake out of a tree. That was my crowning achievement. I'm still so proud of that story. That was actually in grad school. Um, it had been a really slow season to begin with. It'd been weirdly cold. And so I was not getting as many snakes as I needed. I hadn't gotten enough blood samples. And so I found this racer and their name is accurate. They are fast. You have to really chase after them. And I was like, I'm, I'm going to get this snake. It is not going to get away from me. I chased it all over the place. I mean, it had me running all over and it went up into a young tree, like kind of a sapling, but it was tall, but thin. And I was like, you're not getting away from me. And I shook the tree as hard as I could. And the snake actually just fell out of the tree and I tackled it. I launched myself to grab it and it reared up. I mean, they get pretty long too. And they're really strong. It reared up and tried to bite me in the face, but it missed and it bit me in the hat. And I was like, you can't, I I've got you now I win. <laughs> so it was, it was a fight for that snake. And I was very proud that I caught it and shaking it out of the tree was just very, very funny. Well, and and thankfully, bitten in the hat and not in the head. Yes. Yeah, huge exactly. difference there as well. Yes. And, I mean, the experiences, I, I guarantee you, we'll probably have young people, some young people that'll listen to this and they'll hear you and they'll think, you get to do that for a living? Some will think, ooh, no. Others mm -hmm. will think, that might be the coolest job ever, right? That's, that's my hope. I had no idea careers like this existed when I was younger. I went to college thinking I wanted to be a vet. Um, I knew I liked science and I knew I liked animals and I just kind of by lucky chance fell into that lizard research. And that's how I found out this kind of career existed. So I hope that young people hear this and realize that this is something they can pursue because it is extremely rewarding. And it's, I mean, they, they tell you if you find a job you love, you never work a day in your life. And it really does quite often feel like that. I really enjoy, I really look forward to going to work most days. You witnessed a rattlesnake giving birth at the museum? Yes. So um, not long after I started, we had a really old timber rattlesnake that had uh, passed away. And so they'd asked me to go out and collect a new one. So I, it was probably early to mid-May. We went out and we caught one. We were really lucky because they were doing a controlled burn at uh, Kapaya Wildlife Management Area. And when you do controlled burns, everything comes out. It's so easy to catch snakes because they, they're just running away from the fire. And so we immediately caught one. That never happens. It, whenever you're looking for a species, you can't find <laughs> can't it. Can't find it, yeah. Exactly. So we got really lucky. And then 
a few months later, I want to say it was end of July, early August, uh, I get a call from one of our aquarists. She does uh, all of our reptile care, and she's just panicked on the phone. The, the rattlesnake! Babies! It gave birth! <laughs> and I'm thinking she's talking about the diamondback that we've had on display forever. And I'm like, there's no how. Like, unless we had a parthenogenesis episode, which some species, uh, if they're a female, they can basically just clone themselves. They can reproduce asexually. And the babies are genetic clones of the mother. So I'm like, did we have this happen? And then she explains it was the rattlesnake. I'm like, I took a pregnant mother out of the wild. <laughs> so we had about five babies total. Um, and we've still got a few of them. We've got more timber rattlesnakes than we really know what to do with at this point. So we really need to figure out another museum to maybe donate some to. But they were so cute and little. And they're just, they've been really fun to raise up. They're very... They're just so little. Yeah. It, it's it, again, it's interesting to hear you talk. You really love um these creatures. I and do. You, you love snakes. And and again, we'll have people listening going, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's nothing cute about a rattlesnake. But to you, they're cute. They are. Well, especially when they're little babies. I mean, baby everything is pretty much cute. Uh, but aren't they most venomous as babies? I mean, we've always heard that too. No, that's actually a myth. Um, from the moment they are born or hatch, uh, they are in full control of their venom. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mythbusters. Mythbusters, yes. <laughs> on the Mississippi Outdoors podcast <laughs> with Emily Field. It's just fascinating to me. And and I'll I'll say this too before we're done. You know, you mentioned it for you, it's it's not really like work. Yeah. Um your energy and sort of love for the field really comes through in listening to you talk. And I just wonder, you, you mentioned wanting to be a vet, and then at some point the light bulb came yeah. on do you have some days where you look at it and you go you know how did this happen how did i end up here thankful yes oh my god most days it happens when i'm in the field um i had a moment like that when we had just got our first alabama red belly turtle um and i'm like thinking how lucky am i that i'm getting to work with an endangered species i'm getting to do surveys on it i get to be out here mentoring young professionals and boating around and spending my days outside. And I, I just look back and I think, man, that feral little kid would be so proud of me that she wouldn't be able to believe that this is what we ended up doing with our lives. Yeah, that's cool. You know, too, last thing I hear you talk and I think also about, you know, hunters and fishermen. We talk mm -hmm. about, you know, people who fish, walking along the banks, you run into snakes and turtles yeah. and everything. Hunters who are out stomping around different times of year, Am I right? It actually would be to their advantage, to every outdoorsman's advantage to take advantage of the museum, to go through and to learn and, mm -hmm. and kind of learn about these species you're talking about yeah. because they're going to encounter them in yeah. pretty much whatever they're doing. For hunters and fishers especially, I'd encourage them to come to events like we have uh, Snake Day in the summer. We have it in July. I believe this year it's on July 19th. Um I would highly encourage them to come to things like that where we do have, I, I give a talk on identifying venomous species. Um, it's so important to be aware of your surroundings. And I think if you're going to be spending time outside like that, knowing how to keep yourself safe and knowing the wildlife around you is really important. So yeah, absolutely. Come take advantage of the museum. It's an amazing resource. And snake day is at the museum. on the Yes. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Emily. Thanks so much. It's Thank great you. to meet you. Great to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. She is Emily Fields, the state herpetologist. I told myself I'd get it right. I think I got it right here on the Mississippi Outdoors podcast. Thanks for listening. and We'll see you outdoors. <laughs>